afternoon. I know that a few of you are still finding seats and I encourage you to do so as I begin speaking and begin this program because I also sense the growing excitement in this room for our guest speaker today. My name is Diane Bystrom. I'm the director of the Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women in Politics at Iowa State University and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you and to have the opportunity today to hear our featured speaker, the 1999 Mary Louise Smith Chair in Women in Politics. But first, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our official host for this afternoon's program, President Martin Jiske, President of Iowa State University. And he will then introduce our special guest. Dr. Jiske came to Iowa State as president in 1991, and in the ensuing eight years, he has led Iowa State University on a very ambitious quest to become the nation's best land-grant university in the nation. Thanks to Dr. Jiske's leadership and strong support, Iowa State has become a national leader in revitalizing land-grant goals of teaching, research, and outreach. Dr. Jiske is also a national leader in shaping the future of higher education in this country. For example, he serves on the board of directors of the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. He's also one of 25 public university CEOs serving on the Kellogg Commission, a national commission to help shape public education for the 21st century of this nation. Just two weeks ago, the subcommittee he headed issued its report titled, Returning to Our Roots, The Engaged Institution, which calls for our institutions to become more engaged with our students with which we serve. And I think this event today is certainly a representative example of how we're engaging students in this process. So it is my pleasure now to introduce to you Iowa State University President Martin Jiske. Put together quite a crowd. Thank you and welcome. We're delighted to have all of you here with us today. It's a pleasure to add my welcome to CY Stevens Auditorium and the campus of Iowa State University and to today's very special program. In addition to our speaker, we have several guests in the audience, including members of Mary Louise Smith's family, and I'd like to take just a moment to introduce them. We're very pleased to have Mary Louise Smith's grandson, Dr. Robert Smith, his wife, Dr. Susan Smith, and their two and a half year old daughter and Mary Louise's great granddaughter, Tessa, from Kansas City, Missouri. Where are you, Smiths? Please. Both Rob and Susan are supporters of the Mary Louise Smith Chair. Also with us are Senator Charles Grassley. Senator Grassley, where are you, sir? Welcome. We also have with us a member of the State Board of Regents, Dr. Clarkson Kelly and his wife, Phyllis. Clark, Phyllis, welcome. and Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of Illinois, Chicago, Elizabeth Hoffman, who was Dean of our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences when the Katz Center and the Mary Louise Smith Chair were created. Betsy, welcome back. Welcome. Our thanks to all of you for being here. I think we're in for an exceptional program this afternoon. Our guest is not only one of the outstanding political and community leaders of our time, but as her performance in a recent presidential campaign proved, she is one of the most effective communicators and campaigners in the nation. And who knows? We just might have the opportunity to see how good a communicator and campaigner she really is about this time next year here in Iowa with the Iowa caucuses, still the first in the nation's caucuses. (laughs) 
When we created the Mary Louise Smith Chair in Women in Politics, we envisioned it being the vehicle to bring the most prominent, successful, and high-profile women political leaders in the nation to our campus, and it has been everything we had hoped it would be. The first holder of the chair was Nancy Kassebaum, followed by Ruth Mandel. The endowed chair, which has received wide bipartisan support, honors Mary Louise Smith, native Iowan and former chair of the National Republican Party, the only woman ever to hold that position. Ms. Smith passed away just last year, and we're very honored to have this enduring memorial to her here on our campus. We consider it both a great privilege to recognize her many significant accomplishments and a great responsibility to continue her legacy of working to involve more women in our political process and in the leadership of our communities, states, nation, and the world. Elizabeth Dole brings the highest credentials of public service and civic leadership to the Mary Louise Smith Chair in Women in Politics. And like Ms. Smith, she's a role model for all, men and women of all ages who aspire to careers of public service. She has served in leadership positions in five presidential administrations, including as Secretary of Labor for President Bush and Secretary of Transportation for President Reagan, the first woman, I would add, to serve as our Secretary of Transportation. In 1991, she became director of the American Red Cross leading that organization through some of the most devastating and costly national disasters that have ever struck this nation, and doing so with exceptional effectiveness. Under her leadership, the American Red Cross raised more than half a billion dollars for victims of these disasters, helped with major relief efforts in Africa and Croatia, and provided extensive support to U.S. military personnel in action in the Middle East. She is also a member of the Board of Directors of the World Food Prize, an Iowa-based honor which Iowa State is proud to administer. Among her many, many honors, Elizabeth Dole is a member of the National Women's Hall of Fame and the recipient of the League of Women Voters Leadership Award and Women's Executive in State Government Lifetime Achievement Award. And according to a recent Gallup poll survey, she is one of the world's most admired women. And oh yes, her husband is named Bob, a most respected and admired person in his own right, and who I have no doubt would consider it an honor to become the nation's first first gentleman. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce the 1999 holder of the Mary Louise Smith Chair in Women in Politics, Elizabeth Dole. Thank you. Welcome that was beautiful. Welcome. Now, if you could just travel with me and make that same introduction <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> You've got them. Thank you. You've got them. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi, way up there. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> wow. Hi. <laughs> Goodness. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh my goodness, thank you ladies and gentlemen for such a wonderful warm welcome. And Dr. Jiske, thank you so much for those very kind words of introduction. I think that's one of the most beautiful introductions I've ever had. Now if you could just travel with me and make that same introduction everywhere I go, I'd have it made. <laughs> but uh, yes, thank you again for such very kind words. And you have been very successful, sir, in extending the mission of Iowa State University to include new partnerships with government, other educational institutions, and the private sector. I know you've been active as a member of the Board of Directors of the National Association of State Universities and Land-Grant Colleges. And of course, it was a great pleasure to see you at the American Council on Education last Monday. And thank you, Dr. Bystrom, for your outstanding leadership as director of the Katz Center to involve women in the political process, and as an author of two books to contribute to the national thinking on women in politics, and as an educator in journalism and mass communications to inspire the leaders of our next generation. 
And I'm so pleased that so many of those leaders of our next generation are sitting right here in front of me today. It's wonderful to see so many of the students here. And it's a privilege indeed to participate in the Mary Louise Smith Visiting Professor Series because I had great admiration for that wonderful woman. She was such a pioneer for women in politics, the first woman to chair either national political party. And I'm so honored to be with members of her family today, and I hope we'll have a chance to visit uh, after this event. And you know, it feels like a homecoming for me. Over the years, Bob and I have made countless friends here in Iowa, and so many of them are here today. Friends like Senator Chuck Grassley, and I want to say a few words about Chuck. How fortunate you are, ladies and gentlemen, to have such a fine senator representing you in Washington, doing a marvelous job. <laughs> yes, indeed. Whether it's uh, standing up for Iowa farmers or seniors as chairman of the Senate Committee on Aging, or cutting government waste as a co-sponsor of the IRS reform bill, nobody does a better job than Chuck Grassley. Everyone knows that Chuck is the hardest working senator in Washington, and his word is his bond. You can count on that. And when you combine that with diligence and Iowa common sense, not even Washington bureaucrats can stand in his way. <laughs> in fact, his bill, the Congressional Accountability Act, placed Congress under the same laws that they passed for you and me. I think that was a pretty smart move. Chuck, I know that you are famous for visiting all 99 counties each and every year. And over the years, I've had the privilege to visit them with you and Barbara. And you know what I've found? Iowans have a precious resource, a resource that is not so easy to come by in Washington these days, a resource you can't tap in the ground or grow in a field. What is that research, or that resource, rather? <laughs> Iowans tell it like it is. And I really appreciate that, being genuine, telling it like it is. Sun up to sun down, Iowans' honesty, hard work, and common sense are something we could use an extra dose of in Washington, D.C. today. <laughs> and every time I'm back in Iowa, I'm refreshed by something else that many find quaint, simple neighborliness. I remember being in Iowa a lot during the great floods of 1993. How many days were people without water? I think it was almost two weeks. People spending hours in line to get drinking water or traveling 60, 100 miles just to take a shower. Well, I remember meeting one of the thousands of volunteers who despite a family, a job, and numerous other commitments, had her sleeves rolled up. She was doing the back-breaking work of fighting that raging water. It was because of her and literally thousands of others, many of whom are probably right here in this audience today, that you got back on your feet as quickly as you did. When America looks for heroes, we could do no better than to start with people like this. People who get up in the morning, go to work, live by the rules, raise a family, and help their neighbors in times of need. I saw this time and time again at the American Red Cross. And I'm always reminded of it when I visit you here in Iowa. Now, as many of you know, back a couple of years ago, I took a leave of absence from my mission field, the American Red Cross, to undertake another endeavor. I wanted to support my husband in his quest for the presidency. And it was kind of interesting because um, even almost two years later, people will ask me, Elizabeth, have you recovered yet from the campaign? You must have been so exhausted. It must have been so grueling. You know, they s sort of come at it from a negative standpoint, like, oh, it must have been a, a terrible experience. Well, I want to set the record straight because I was asked that as recently as yesterday, believe it or not. It was one of the highlights of my life, that uh, period of time, of course, supporting my husband for the presidency. But the reason that it was such a highlight mainly was because I met so many wonderful people all across America. I met only one rude person, really, in 14 months of campaigning, one person. And this was a man who folded his arms like this, and he just wasn't going to speak to me. So I went over to him, and I said, you know, I feel so lucky that you're only the first person I've met in a whole year of campaigning who wasn't willing just to shake my hand. Have a good day. 
Do you think, was that too ugly? I mean, <laughs> I couldn't help it. Oh. And then another reason that this was uh, such a special time for me is that after a speech, people would come up to me and they'd bring me something inspirational, something uplifting. This happened over and over and over again. It might be some scripture or a devotional book, something that really inspired me. And I have boxes of all this material. And so I thought it might be nice to write a little book on the positive side of a campaign. All the great people you meet and the inspirational things that uh, you've collected along the way. Maybe share a little of my own faith in the process and also share a little of the humor. You know, I think you tend to forget the frustrating times as the months go by and you remember all these happy things. But one thing that uh, I'll always remember is some of the humorous things along the campaign trail. Now, my husband made a number of speeches about values, the good old days, when you could leave your keys in the car, you know, when you could leave the front door unlocked. And after one of those speeches, a lady wrote in and she said, Dear Senator Dole, we're from California. We have four children. And she said, we don't have very much money and we wanted to go to Garden City, Kansas to see my mother. And so she said, we, uh, pack, we packed the children in the car and we just started off and we didn't at motels since we don't have much money. By the time we got to your hometown, to Russell, Kansas, the kids were very much in need of a bath. And so we went to Aunt May's house. She wasn't there, but the door was open. So we went in, we gave the kids a bath, and then we freshened up, and still no Aunt May. So we went in the kitchen, we fixed some lunch, and then we thought, we better get on the road. Mother's waiting for us. And so they left a note saying, Aunt May, we're sorry we missed you. Thanks for the hospitality. We'll see you on the way home. That night in Garden, Kansas, telling her mother all about this story, you know, the mother looks at her daughter with horror and says, oh no, did I forget to tell you Aunt May moved away to Kansas City? <laughs> Can you imagine? Now in case you all think I'm making this up, see, I brought a copy of that letter because I wanted you to see. This, this is incredible. Here it is. It's a long two-page handwritten letter. And at the end of it, she says, Senator Dole, that wasn't your house, was it, in Russell, Kansas? <laughs> so I thought, since I have her address here, that I might just call her up and say, where was that house in Russell, Kansas? And then call them and ask them, what did you think when you came home and someone had been in your bathtub, in your kitchen? How did you feel, you know? I mean, it's really quite an amazing story, isn't it? But then another thing that happened along the way, and maybe some of you remember this. In fact, if you do, I wish you'd raise your hands for a minute. Who remembers seeing me toward the end of the campaign on the Jay Leno show? Raise your hands real high. Okay, we have quite a few Leno watchers here today. Well, for those who didn't see it, let me describe this scene. The first scene is Elizabeth Dole standing at the gate to the studio. And I'm dressed in jeans, boots, and a black leather jacket with chains, no less. <laughs> and I can't get the gate up. It's stuck. I can't get in. Then you see Jay Leno sitting in front of his audience. And I'm saying, Jay, Jay, I can't get in. The gate's stuck. And I've got to get the campaign trail. Jay says, oh my word, that's the third guest this week who hadn't been able to get in. We're going to have to get that gate fixed. And he says, wait a minute, Elizabeth, I'm coming for you. And he jumps on his Harley Davidson, and he goes roaring off to pick me up at the gate. Then the scene shifts back to the gate, and Jay is saying, Elizabeth, have you ever been on a motorcycle before? Jay, I'm a biker from way back, I say. <laughs> and I turn around, and the back of the jacket has bikers for Bob, you see. <laughs> Now, truth be told, this is the first time I have ever been on a motorcycle. <laughs> I mean, I'll do anything for my husband, right? <laughs> so I jump on this motorcycle, grab hold of Jay Leno, and say, rev it, baby, let's get out of here. <laughs> now the scene shifts to a stunt woman. And she looks like me from a distance, you see. She's got on the jeans, the boots, the black leather jacket with the chains. And they start leaping over barriers like this on the motorcycle. She stands up on the back, no hands. She gets up on his shoulders, no hands. <laughs> 
And then if you can imagine, she lies down across the back of the motorcycle like this and puts one foot up in the air, you know, like that. Well, the next scene then is Jay and me riding into the audience. And I've got my helmet on and I'm on the back of the motorcycle. And I get off, take off the helmet and he interviews me. The mail poured in <laughs> after this event from all across America. One lady wrote in and said, Dear Mrs. Dole, I am half your age and I've been a biker all my life and I cannot begin to do the stunts that you did on the Jay Leno show. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> and then there's a lady who wrote in and said, Dear Mrs. Dole, I had not planned to vote in the presidential election, but now that I'm seeing you on the Jay Leno show, now if you have any political science majors or political science professors in the room today, just think about this. The one reason she's going to vote for a man for president is that she saw his wife on a motorcycle. <laughs> now that I've seen you on the Jay Leno show, I'm going to support your husband. And I'm certain that he's going to win. And when he does, be sure to do your routine in the inaugural parade. <laughs> I mean, can't you see it coming down Pennsylvania Avenue on my motorcycle? <laughs> I used to kid them at the Red Cross and say, well, maybe we could pull out the Harley Davidson and do a big fundraiser. <laughs> well, speaking of Bob, and as you've heard, I love to speak of Bob. In the early days of the Reagan administration, I served as assistant to the president for public liaison. And I was charged with rallying support for the president's agenda. Well, one evening, my staff and I were meeting to divide up the names of senators who'd not yet taken a position on one of the president's uh, legislative initiatives. And the session came to an abrupt halt when I said I was going home to cook a candlelight dinner. That's great, Elizabeth, said my deputy, Red Cavaney. But he said, it's only 6 p.m. Isn't it a little bit early to be going home? Don't you want to finish targeting those undecided senators? Red, I said, you don't seem to understand. Tonight, I'm targeting Bob Dole. <laughs> and for those of you wondering, I did get Bob's vote. <laughs> and even though the candlelight dinner was very successful, I never tried it out on any other senator, OK? <laughs> <laughs> well, the art of persuading senators is just one lesson that I've learned in my years in the nation's capital. During that career, I've been privileged to have three very distinct missions. As Secretary of Transportation, I was charged with overseeing America's material resources, you know, highway construction, shipbuilding, air traffic control. In fact, uh, the sale of Conrail was on my watch, the government's freight railroad. It was the flagship of privatization. And it was the largest initial industrial stock, stock offering to date at that time in the United States. And we were so thrilled when we sold it for $2 billion because that was going to help reduce the deficit. And I can still see Jim Burnley, who worked for me then, running down the street in the rain with his coattails flapping to put that $2 billion in the Treasury so we wouldn't lose a single day's interest on that much money, right? <laughs> and then as Secretary of Labor, my priority was America's human resources, of trying to improve the skills of our workforce and helping to resolve a very bitter 11-month Pittston coal strike working with a super mediator that was acceptable to the United Mine Workers and to the Piston Company, and also trying to turn young lives around, youth at risk to gangs, drugs, teen pregnancy, dropping out of school, showing them that uh, uh, some caring and some job training could turn those young lives around from the most negative behavior, gang leader, for example, to kids who were preparing for a good job and many for college. And that was very rewarding work. And then at the American Red Cross, my focus was on inner resources, inspiring people to volunteer, to give of their financial resources, and to give their blood, because the Red Cross provides almost half of America's blood supply. And today, I've been asked to share with you a few of the insights I've gained about organizations and people, and a few observations about how America has changed and how we must change in the future. For in today's fast-paced world, the only constant is change. Perhaps the biggest change that I've witnessed during my career is the role of women, both in the public sector and in the workforce in the private sector. 
And let me hasten to say that a very important career is that of mother raising fine young future citizens and volunteer. That's an outstanding career, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> I can still vividly recall my first day of class at Harvard Law School. I was one of 24 women in a class of 550. And a male student came up to me and demanded to know in what can only be described as tones of moral outrage what I was doing there. I can still hear him saying, because these are the first words I heard in that law school, Elizabeth, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Don't you realize there are men who give their right arm to be in this law school? men who would use their legal education. That's how I was greeted to law school. And that man is now a senior partner in a very prestigious Washington law firm. And ever so often, I tell that little story around town. <laughs> I love to tell that story around town. <laughs> and you'd be amazed at the number of my male classmates in high-powered Washington law firms who've called up to say, Tell me I'm not the one. Tell me I didn't say it. I'm just going to let them stew about it, you know? Well, I remember the day in the early 1970s when I was working at the Nixon White House as Deputy Special Assistant to the President for Consumer Affairs. And I hurried to the Metropolitan Club in Washington for a meeting with some Cleveland, Ohio lawyers and businessmen. And as I rushed by him, the doorman yelled out, Stop, lady. You can't come in here. Women are not permitted in this club. And I said, you know, there must be some mistake, some misunderstanding. My name is Elizabeth Hanford, I said. I work right across the street. And I said, these uh, businessmen and lawyers have flown in here from Cleveland, Ohio for this meeting, and they're up on the fourth floor. And he said, lady, I don't care if your name is Queen Elizabeth. You're not coming in this club. <laughs> well, the meeting took place after I sent over one of the men who had not spent the whole weekend getting ready for this meeting the way I had, but uh, those events occurred in the past. Today, over 40% of students entering Harvard Law School are female. The Metropolitan Club and many others across the country have long since opened their doors to women. And at the Department of Labor, I met regularly with seven assistant secretaries, and four of them for policy, congressional affairs, public affairs, and international affairs were female. And while women most certainly have not reached the millennium, particularly in failing to equal the earnings of our male counterparts and in the disturbingly low increase in the number of women in top management positions, there are other signs that women are playing key roles in the revolutionary change in America's workforce. Women-owned businesses are the fastest growing segment of the U.S. small business economy. And recently, these women-owned businesses employed more workers than all the Fortune 500 corporations combined. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And as women enter the workforce in record numbers, they bring with them unique skills. For example, dealing with needs, issues, and market forces that are often not clearly defined. Rebecca McDonnell, who's the former president of Tenneco's natural gas marketing subsidiary, points out, women have a higher tolerance for ambiguity because we're always responsible for tending to the emotional needs of others, which are very fluid. We learn to read between the lines and come up with creative solutions for accommodating people. Well, in my case, I had a baptism by fire when it came to creative solutions. <laughs> when I got to Washington after I finished law school, I wanted to take cases for indigents, for people who couldn't afford a lawyer. But the only problem was, and that was going to be my charity work, you know, the only problem was I didn't take trial practice when I was in law school. So I thought, I'll go sit in the court, private citizen. I was not with legal aid, but I just decided that I would go down and sit in night court because there was such a load on our courts in Washington at that time that they decided to have a 90-day night court, see if they could eliminate some of the overload. So I was going to observe and learn my way around the courtroom before I asked to take a case for an indigent. Well, I was sitting there one night. I was kind of down on the front row, I think. The man next to me said, the judge up on the bench is the toughest, 
man, the toughest judge in the entire Washington area. He had no more said that than Judge Buddy Beard looked down at me and he said, who are you? And I said, my name's Elizabeth Hanford. What are you doing here, he said. I've seen you here three nights. I said, I'm observing, Your Honor, so that I can take cases for indigence. Miss Hanford said, are you a member of the DC Bar? Yes, sir. Come up here. I have a case for you. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not ready. He said, Miss Hanford, if you're a member of the DC Bar, you're ready. Come up here. So I had about 15 seconds to decide what to do, you know. I mean, if I was going to pass this before man, I better get up there, right? <laughs> Not get on the wrong side of him. So I went up to the bench and he handed me the information slip and I opened it up and I was to defend a man who was accused of petting a lion in the National Zoo. <laughs> okay, now what do we do, right? <laughs> well, one of the detectives walked over and he said, Miss Hanford, you probably don't know where the cell block is. I mean, this man is locked up now for petting a lion. And I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, let me take you downstairs. The cell block is under the courtroom. So we went down on the elevator. Now remember, this is 1966. And these men hanging on the bars had not seen any women in their cell block, right? So as I walk through, they start chanting and clapping and, you know, it was really kind of scary. And then one of them, one of them said, I kept yelling out the name Marinas, Mr. Marinas, trying to find my defendant. And when I finally uh, got on to what was happening, he said, hey man, she's your lawyer. And did they think that was funny? You know, more clapping, more chanting, all the rest. Well, when I finally got to Mr. Marinas, there was one problem. He spoke almost no English. He did not understand what I was saying. And I kept saying, look, this is not the most serious crime. I can get you out tonight. But under our system, you must come back in three weeks to stand trial. And of course, that gave me three weeks to learn how to have a trial, right? <laughs> well, he finally began to pick up on it a little bit. He said, no, no, I leave. I go to New York. I never come back. Well, about that moment, the US Marshal arrived. And he said, Miss Hanford, Judge Beard is ready for you. I said, I am not ready for Judge Beard. The defendant doesn't understand what's going on. He said, it is Judge Beard, you'd better come upstairs. So here I got on the elevator, went upstairs, and all these people surrounded me when I got off the elevator. And they said, what are you gonna do with this case? What are you gonna do with this case? And I said, well, I can't let the defendant go tonight. He'll leave town, never come back. I can't leave him locked up for three weeks on the charge of petting a lion. So I said, we're going to trial tonight. Although I said, I have never seen a trial except on Perry Mason. <laughs> <sighs> they started writing it down. We then had three news in Washington. It was the Washington Post, the Evening News, the Star. And I said, please don't write this down. I thought you were court personnel. And you know what they did? They wrote even faster. They couldn't wait to get it down. So now here's the scene. The courtroom is packed. There are 200 people there. The entire Washington press corps is there. The defendant doesn't have the foggiest idea what's going on. His lawyer has never seen a trial except on Perry Mason. The judge is the toughest anywhere within miles of Washington, D.C. And I look up the U.S. attorney slot, and guess who's going to be prosecuting this case? Mr. Lee Freeman, number one in my class at Harvard Law School, editor of the Harvard Law Review. <laughs> well. To make a long story short, by the grace of God, I won that case. And here's how I did it. If you go into a national zoo anywhere in the country, look at the law. It's posted there, the statute. And it says you are not to annoy or tease the animals in the zoo. Now tell me, without the lion there as a witness, how do you know if he was annoyed or teased, <laughs> right? There's no way to know. <laughs> I'll tell you, Lee Freeman, he nearly had a heart attack, you know, he really did. And he said, oh, your honor, this man was found in the antelope cage three weeks ago. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, I got out of there as fast as I could that night, and my next case was armed robbery.
But while, <laughs> while I was challenged by my courtroom experiences, I decided from almost my first days in Washington that I was going to bypass the full-time practice of law and instead seek a career in government service. Now, like many others of my generation, I regarded public service as a noble calling, as a chance to make a difference in the issues of our time. Some said back then that I had stars in my eyes when it came to my desire to work in government, and perhaps I did. But my years as a, a servant of the public were everything I had hoped for and more. And that's a message that I want to share with the young people who are here today. I share it because over the years, Americans have grown increasingly disenchanted with our government. I believe many qualified people are being discouraged from entering government service or from running for office today. The words, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, are guaranteed to get laughs every time. And that was not the case when I started out. In fact, at the end of the 1950s and the beginning of the 60s, when Americans were asked, how much of the time can you trust your government to do the right thing? Two out of every three citizens answered all of the time or most of the time. When that question is asked today, all of the time or most of the time is the response of barely three out of 10 Americans. Now, what's behind this dramatic transformation? Well, I believe the federal government has become too big, too bloated, too complex, too bureaucratic. Decisions once made in state legislatures, in city halls, around kitchen tables, are now made in Washington. People feel that their government doesn't have confidence in their wisdom, therefore they shouldn't have confidence in their government. What we need to do, it seems to me, is to remember the wisdom of our country's founders, and something that Bob and I talked about a lot in the 1996 campaign, the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution those powers that are not specifically delegated to the federal government or prohibited to the states are reserved for the states and for we the people, that's you and me. Now, speaking of our founders, have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? Bob and I found something on an airplane one day called Aid, and this particular uh, uh, article impressed me so much, and my history was a little rusty, that I got a couple of historians to check this out to be sure it was absolutely accurate. And I want to share just a few paragraphs with you. Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or the hardships of the war. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Now, what kind of men were they? Well, 24 were lawyers and jurists. 11 were merchants. Nine were farmers and large plantation owners. They were men of means. They were well-educated. But they signed that Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. And here are just a few examples. Carter Braxton of Virginia, he was a wealthy planter and trader, and he saw his ships just swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts, and he died in rags. And there's another, Thomas McKean, who was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. And listen to this one. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson, Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. And so he went quietly to General George Washington and urged him to open fire on his own home. They did, his home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife, and she died within a few months. John Hart, he was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields, his grist mill were laid waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. And a few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. 
These men were not wild-eyed rabble-rousers. They were soft-spoken men of means and education. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, they pledged to each other their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor. And courageous men and women of honor have continued to sacrifice for our country throughout our history. What would these patriots think if they could see America today? What's happened to honor, duty, personal responsibility? Three and four decades ago, a generation came of age in this country with expectations as innocent as they were grand. We wanted for America more freedom, more tolerance, more compassion. And there were amazing advances. We overturned legal segregation and we made progress against discrimination. We have seen real gains for women and minorities and we must never go back, not an inch. American ingenuity transformed the way people work, learn, and communicate in a world without walls. Who among us would turn back the clock? Yet this country, which has come so far, has lost so much. Our sense of limitless possibility has run into a stone wall of crime, violence, drugs, illegitimacy, and incivility. The deep and unsettling fear is that the nation given to us by our founders and given to many of us, the older folks in this audience, by our parents, was a much better place than the America that we're preparing to turn over to our children. And the insult of this injury is that our intentions were good. We wanted our schools not only to teach, but to nurture children's self-esteem and solve a variety of social problems. But now, in many cases, they hardly teach at all. When we were growing up, our education system, kindergarten through 12th grade, was the envy of the world. Now almost every parent whose child can't escape our schools is desperate to reform them. We wanted to end the silly censorship, which kept Huckleberry Finn in a brown paper wrapper. But ladies and gentlemen, we've ended up with a pornographic culture and a society that no longer blushes. We ached for poor children, hungry in the richness of America and we created a welfare system to help them. But when we substituted handouts for jobs, we destroyed responsibility. When welfare programs offered a choice between cash and a husband, we devalued marriage. When fatherless children took control of the streets, we lost society's linchpin, respect for the law. We wanted to ensure that our courts were fair, our police were careful and that the innocent had a chance to be heard, regardless of personal wealth or political power. But today we have a system of crime without punishment, victims without justice, and neighborhoods without peace. We are a good and noble people, but we've forgotten that the strength of our rights depends on their limits, that the shifting sands of changing wants is no ground upon which to build a nation. For if our eyes are open, we cannot avert them from the fact that our children are suffering today. We want the world of our children to be a safe harbor, shielded from worry. Our parents managed that for us. We lived in homes with locks we didn't turn, on streets where we played safely till dark on long summer evenings. But what has happened to that simple gift? Children today have email and Nintendo, but what they lack is the ease of living in a world without worry. Why are we not giving our children what was given to us? There are many complex reasons, but I believe there's one reason above the others. In seeking to make America better, we have neglected what made her good. We've been embarrassed to talk about the values that make our lives happy and safe and fulfilled. The values of those patriots responsibility and altruism, courage and perseverance, honesty and respect for your fellow man, discipline, modesty, and a willingness to work not for our own gratification, but for the joy of knowing that our children will benefit. We must ask ourselves if in pursuing life's options, we have left behind the fundamentals. We have campus speech codes to keep us civil, 
We apply harassment rules to schoolyard kisses. Drug policies have become so tied in knots we can no longer distinguish between aspirin and crack. And edicts from our courts now protect the freedom of molesters and stalkers and abusers so well that America's children and daughters and wives no longer trust society to keep them safe. This substitution of regulation for responsibility is a kind of puritanism for people who no longer believe in character, who no longer believe in the wisdom and goodness of the people. But we will never write enough rules. We'll never write enough rules. Individual and national character are what we need. I think many of us have reached a point of reflection, a kind of collective head shaking. Are we content with what's happening on our watch? When we pass control of America to our children, will we be proud of the choices we made, of the country those choices produced? Are things beginning to change? I believe the answer is yes. Do your own thing is giving way to respect your parents. Family time is becoming a priority again. People are openly hungry for the inner peace that comes from faith. And countless children are going to sleep each night to the sound of a parent's voice reading from the Book of Virtues. And what is true in our lives can also be true in our country. I believe we must choose education over social engineering. We must teach our children again the basics of math and reading and citizenship. How appalling that one in four high school seniors in the great United States of America is considered functionally illiterate. We've got to restore our public schools to greatness, returning discipline and parental involvement to every school in America. And in those cases, especially in low-income areas, where schools have failed completely, parents must be given other choices. Low-income, and low middle income parents should have the same power as those who are well off or well connected. The power to protect their children from chaos in orderly classrooms where they can learn. Every parent has a right to that power. Now, you Iowans have many reasons to be proud of your educational system. For many years, Iowa students have performed at or near the top in scholastic tests. And I'm sure that one of the reasons is because Iowans take responsibility for their children's education seriously. Committed teachers, involved parents, and active local school boards provide the nurturing support. And active local school boards provide the nurturing support with your excellent system of community and private colleges, as well as your three state-supported universities. And we all know that Iowa State University is one of the very best land-grant universities in the entire United States of America, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. <clears throat> now, we must choose to return safety to our streets and moral seriousness to our war on drugs. At least 70% of all crimes involve the illegal drug trade and drug abuse. Drug use among our youth has increased enormously over recent years. In one year alone, cocaine use increased 166% among teenagers. And one half of all 12th graders have tried marijuana. One fourth of eighth graders, eighth graders, have used marijuana. From 1992 to 97, illegal drug use among teenagers more than doubled. And here in Iowa, methamphetamine has penetrated nooks and crannies all across the state. From Des Moines to Creston, from the cities to the countryside, meth is present. When you have children who should be playing their first junior high school basketball game being arrested for selling meth, our world has gone astray. I know, Senator Grassley, that you've put together an anti-drug coalition called Face It Together, FIT, which seeks to join people in a community-based approach to fight this epidemic. 
parents, students, businesses, religious leaders, law enforcement, and the media. And I heartily applaud your efforts. And I think everyone here should, and this is a major problem that we're gonna get control of with the help of everyone here. And thank you, Senator Grassley. Now, as citizens of the greatest country on the face of this earth, we've got to trust ourselves and our values, not solely the government and its intentions. I believe we must direct resources and authority back to parents and principals, policemen and pastors, men and women with the power to turn a community around, starting with a single life or a single classroom or a single street corner. The hope of our nation, ladies and gentlemen, is the conscience and the character of our children. Their freedom and our future depend on the reaffirmation of America's first principles. None of us can claim perfection, and few can wear the mantle of hero or heroine, but each of us has the option of choosing a life of decency and self-discipline, self-reliance and diligence. From time to time, we all fail our own standards, but our standards will never fail us. Yes, our nation has been on a long and restless journey, but we have begun to rediscover the place that is our home and to see its wonder as if for the first time, a place where simple goodness built national greatness, a country where hope is born with every child. We can never return to an age of innocence, but we can move on to an age of rediscovery. With clear heads, open eyes, and full hearts, we can choose above all else those things that are most important that will endure, that we will always see as noble. Our future is not preordained. We must choose it. But I believe it is the American destiny to choose well. Thank you so very much for the privilege of speaking with you today. God bless you, each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> great to see you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> it's great being with you. Thanks. So much. Hope that was hope that hit the right tone. <laughs> Good. I wanted, I wanted to thank Elizabeth Dole again for accepting our invitation to serve as the Mary Louise Smith Chair in Women in Politics this year and following in the footsteps of Mary Louise for offering inspiration not only in her words today through her career and through whatever the future may hold for her. Uh, joining me today are two students affiliated with the Carrie Chapman Cat Center, Melissa Martinez, a Legacy of Heroine Scholar and Elizabeth Keller, a CAT associate, who will be speaking on behalf of the Iowa State University community and thanking Mrs. Dole. We would like to thank you for coming to speak at Iowa State University and on behalf of the Legacy of Heroines program and the CAT associates program at Iowa State University, we would like to present to you a small token of our appreciation for serving as the 1999 Mary Louise Smith Chair in Women, Women in Politics. Bless you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again. It's great being with you today. Thanks. Take care now. Should we go on off or? Okay. Should I open or go yeah. ahead? Okay. If you hold it. Who's holding the papers for me? Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. Look at this. All right. <laughs> How about it? <laughs> Great. What is this one? We've got something else in here, too. Let's see. Let's see what this one is now. OK, here's another one. That's great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'll wear it with pride, OK? I'll wear it with pride. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Great. 